One of the most difficult challenges in FTC robotics is figuring out the answer to the question, where is your robot in space? Wait about three, four, five, and then we should transition to our next state. By the end of today's video, you'll understand how you can use dead wheel odometry to be able to answer that question. I'm Coach Pratt, and I've been teaching robotics design for over a decade now, and I've mentored FTC teams to winning national championships. And today I'm going to step you through what dead wheel odometry is and why you might want to use it fundamentally how the concept works, the different ways that you can set up dead wheel odometry. That'll also let you know what are some different solutions you can use to either purchase a, a dead wheel odometry pod or make your own that is just as reliable for a lot cheaper. So at its most simple, dead wheel odometry is a localization method. It's a way of telling you where your robot is relative to where it started at the beginning of the match. Some teams will use the encoders inside of their wheels themselves, that works honestly just fine with traction wheels or a standard tank saw wheel. When you swap over things like mechanum, these things tend to slip. And because you're keeping track of the number of rotations here, as these wheels slip, you end up getting a little less accurate. So these dead wheels, even if these wheels themselves are slipping and not actually rotating where they are on space, the dead wheels are effectively that. They're a wheel that is dead that does not rotate and it stays in place. And as it stays in place, it's capable of spinning to keep track of which rotation point you're on. So you can end up keeping track of your absolute position, your x axis and your absolute position in your y axis Relatively standard configuration is having two dead wheel odometry pods up at the top. And uh, you have one for your x axis one for your y axis Problem with just using two wheels is that now you have no way of keeping track of rotation. Now, one classic way of solving the odometry pod question of how do you make sure you check for rotation is you can have two odometry pods on your x axis and one odometry pod on your y axis one of these odometry pods is counting ticks as you move in specific directions along an x axis movement another pod is counting these things up as you move along on a y axis movement so you can keep track of just how many turns you've rotated moving this way how many turns you've rotated back now the problem with just using a standard two pod is there's no way of knowing if you're rotating in space so what some teams will do is they'll add a third pod on top and have two on their x axis And what this allows you to do is this allows you to count the difference in how these two have added up between each other. And then you can know that your robot has rotated in space. But the way that some teams get around just having two pods is they add in an additional IMU. You can use the IMU that's attached to the control hub itself. GoBuilder also sells a pinpoint computer that has an IMU built into it. So you have one pod for your X, one pod for your Y. And then you also get the IMU, which keeps track of your heading, which will give you your rotation changes over time. Now, in my experience, the Go Build a Pinpoint computer has a really accurate IMU. They've done a lot of tuning on this thing, and it also makes your read times a little bit faster. But I have also had a great experience using the IMU on the control hub. One thing you have to make sure is just watch out for ESD events on this. So make sure you have this thing relatively well isolated. Got a whole video on that explained down below because sometimes uh, the IMU can end up resetting on this. There are also other external IMU sensors that you can buy that you can plug into an I2C port on your board. Uh, in my experience, I haven't had a lot of success with other external IMUs. But again, your mileage may vary. Now, one of the types that have been around the FTC community for a long time is the swing arm odometry pod. And how this one works is you have a constant tension spring on the back end. That as you press this, it's constantly pulling against spring and wanting to force the wheel back down. We can see back here, we've got that constant tension spring, or not constant tension, sorry, we just have a standard linear spring that as this arm springs down, it pulls the spring out and it wants to force the arm back down as it goes. Now, swing arm or object pods are pretty reliable. They're far more readily available on the market. Uh, there's a lot more different designs that exist. There's also far more DIY designs that exist that are going to be more reliable as well uh, using a spring arm or odometry pod. Now, one of the drawbacks of a swing arm is obviously it takes up a lot of space depending on how much compression you end up having this facing down on your robot. It also faces an issue of an arc problem with if it goes up and over different bump surfaces, you end up having minute differences in the amount of tracking that you're actually doing. Now, in an FTC context, the amount of arc that is actually going to add to an odometry is, is so it's minuscule that it really is not going to throw things off that much. And I think a, a lot of people are get a little overrated about things when it comes to that. Yes, it's less accurate, but again, it comes down to pragmatically, is there really that much of a difference uh, in terms of how much it actually puts out? Eh, not really. 
terms of commercial off the self products, uh, Good Builders has got a swing arm odometry pod here. It's a nice little piece of kit. It's a little bit bulky, but it does the job for what it is need to do. And it's been pretty reliable in my experience. I've used it for a few seasons now, and my teams have been pretty happy with them. For uh, linear vertical autopods, we've got this nice little setup here from GoBuilda. It's signed up on a aluminum backplate here, and it's got a little four bar linkage that allows it to shift up and down linearly. And it's actually a pretty nice amount of weight here. And this is specifically tuned for FTC as well. So the amount of spring force this thing requires to push down on the field is generally, in my experience, not enough to actually cause your robot to drift off in other directions when these things are pressing down to the floor. It has happened in some experience, so I would have liked a little bit less spring tension on this. But this is pretty reliable for being able to kick back down. It's got a little 32 millimeter odometry wheel, or sorry, omni wheel on the side here. Take a look from the other side. It's quite thin. It's quite a small, compact design. It's a pretty overall pretty slick, but you are definitely going to pay uh, for what you end up getting here. But overall, if you're kind of looking for the absolute top, this is the smallest form factor you can buy in a pre-made kit for a vertical linear slide. But like other vertical linear slides, you still also face the issue of when you're strafing on this side, you'll be fine because it's that little four bar length is quite slick. But when you're strafing towards this direction, you will still end up facing some of that binding as it comes down the side, which might make it less likely for it to strafe properly once on the side here. Now, another option you've got in the vertical linear section here is a nice budget option from East Loose Components. Now, full disclosure, the guys here at East Loose Components did send me a few of their odometry pods to be able to take a look at. But as always, my thoughts are always my own. My opinions are always my own. And I'll always give you my honest opinion on any product I'm taking a look at. And overall, I've been pretty impressed with these. I've been using these to set up Pedro pathing for doing some autonomous programming on mine, and they're a great solution. Now, they're not as compact as the GoBuilda uh, vertical linears are. Those ones are, are quite compact. However, I have no problem fitting these in in packaging. It depends on where it is you're going to be sitting it in on your robot. And as far as price goes, if you're going to buy a two-pod setup, it's going to cost you about 150 US with GoBuilda, whereas it only costs you about 90 US for one of these little East Loop components. Now, because this is 3D printed and sets up bushing, as far as a little bit of that linear sag I was talking about there, it's not near as rigid, but I haven't had any problem with this because it's set up on a linear spring here. Even when it does rotate, the wheel is still contacting to the ground. And I've also found that there's enough spring tension on this that it's not actually rotating my robot, but it ends up keeping it in place. Another nice thing about these East Loop components is similar to the Rev through bore encoder, you can also set these things up on other systems. So rather than just setting up on an odometry pod like I have here, I could put a standard hex bore shaft through this thing, have a little 3D printed adapter to set it up with my GoBo 8mm shafts that I typically use. And you can have it both in relative position and in absolute position. So you can have it always remember where its position starts and finishes at. Not very helpful in the context of odometry, but a great little tool to have in your kit. And of course, you also have things like the open odometry pod system that was been popular for a little while here. It uses the Rev through bore encoders. Now, one thing to keep in mind on these components is that they are not, at least as far as I can tell, I don't know if they're factory zeroed as they come in from the factory. So that is something to consider on some of that. But on a budget option, I think that you're not going to be able to buy and be able to afford all these extra things. And it's a fantastic solution for odometry. Now, at the end of the day, the whole purpose of dead wheel odometry is another localization system that exists. There are many other localization systems that exist in FTC. I've got a full video down below. But as far as being able to find autonomous pathing, dead wheel odometry seems to be one of the best uh, solutions to be able to solve the problem of where is my robot relative to where I started at the beginning of the match. If you get in, want to get in on even more of the budget side here, you can check out East Loop's components. Uh, you can use code Brogan Pratt to get yourself 5% off. If you're looking for more robotics resources, things like CAD files, things like code snippets for doing different things like odometry and some of these odometry pods, uh, you can consider joining my community down below. So you want to have a robot that's able to strafe and move around the field and not get lost and keep track of where it is, dead wheel geometry is definitely the best way to go about that. Let me know if you got any questions in the comments down below. And as always, best of luck out there this FTC season.